Hello and welcome to our third anniversary and Gen Con wrap-up show. I'm Tim the Dad and let's just kind of get this out of the way right now. There's kind of a uh, big elephant in the room so let's address that. And yeah, I'm not talking about Tim Norris either. Uh, as you can see, Megan is not here. So uh, Megan, why don't you tell us where you're at and what you're doing? Hi guys, Megan the daughter here. Uh, you might have noticed that I haven't been around in so many videos lately and it's because of something to do with this. So I am back working at Disney for my second college program. I started in May and I will be here until my birthday in January. So I know Dad's got a lot of cool things coming up. He's going to be promoting, you know, stuff with Gen Con at the 50th and giving you a bunch of cool new videos. Might be even some special guests popping in, so keep an eye out. I'll be popping in here a little bit there. Just check Facebook, it'll be probably more there. But just wanted to let you guys know I'll still be here and content is still going to be going out just as good. Bye guys! Okay, this is usually the part of the show that uh, Megan handles, but like she said, uh, she is down at Disney as part of the Disney College program. So uh, let me go over some of the gee whiz numbers from the last year. Uh, we are up to 3,500 YouTube subscribers, which is a pretty good sized jump from last year. So we thank you guys for watching. We have 309 videos as of this recording right now. We've got a bunch still that uh, we need to get through from uh, Origins and Gen Con. So we'll be rolling those out to the channel over the next several weeks. Uh, we have had 394,749 views of our videos. So again, thanks guys for watching, because if you weren't watching, we wouldn't be doing this. Um, we have almost 1,200 followers on Facebook, and that's really kind of how uh, the best method is for you know talking to us, finding out what we've got coming up on our channel, what I'm playing with my gaming group, and you know, you kind of get a sneak peek of maybe some of the things that we're playing here, uh, you know, with mom and dad. So, uh, and we also have uh, our Patreon account going, and we really appreciate uh, those that have sponsored us. So, we're going to be uh, using some of those funds in order to make better videos, make them look better, make them sound better, that sort of thing. So, we really appreciate you guys. So, now, without further ado, Let's skip into the Gen Con 2017 kind of overview. I'll talk about the games I demo, talk about some of the other things that I've seen. So check this out. Okay, let's break this down by day uh, and I'll kind of talk about some of the games that I demoed and some of these you're going to be able to see a small video on. Others I'm going to hold off from the video uh, because we have a show coming up on them, either an unboxing or uh, an actual review show. Okay, so first up on Thursday of Gen Con, one of the first games that I demoed was The Godfather, Corleone's Empire. This is from Simon. It is a area control sort of worker placement where you are shaking down businesses. You are collecting money that you want to get in your suitcase because ultimately that's how you're going to win is to have money in your suitcase. You can spend some of that money to do other things, but a really cool game uh, it is from designer Eric Lang. Uh, this we will be having a special unboxing video on this very soon and probably dad's game group review later this year so look for that one so next up one of the games that i was really anticipating demoing was the thing uh infection at outpost 31 that was from usaopoly 
it was one of those where you had to sign up for that. Uh, it was an hour-long demo, but you pretty much got to play the entire game. I, I spent your whole life no, trying I'm to roll high, right? When you all of a sudden need to roll a one. Oh. I, I mean, I could always That's just I could always just blood test him and then use it for rolls. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, well, but then he's probably yeah. he's but, probably but, uh, yeah. <laughs> if he's that good, where he's the he thing and he's misrolling. Nope. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Right, we're gonna try for the five. All right, it's yeah. yeah. roll five. Yeah. Everybody know whammy? Five. You got five. 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 I got five. double five. everything. He is, he is the thing. Oh, that would have been a one. Use the flamethrower. Use the flamethrower. <laughs> Next up, one of the games I demoed is a brand new game from Passport Game Studios called Professor Evil and the Citadel of Time. Now this is a cooperative game where you play characters that are going around uh, Professor Evil's kind of uh, mansion, if you will, and he's got things that he has stolen, so you want to make sure that you are able to recover those before he is able to get those locked away and you can't do anything about it. Uh, Again, that's going to be one we're going to be featuring on our channel very soon, so check back with us later on that. So one of the movies growing up, or I should say a series of movies uh, that was playing when I was growing up, were the old Planet of the Apes movies. Now, IDW has a game called Planet of the Apes from designer Richard Launius that is coming out later this year. Uh, and they had a preview of that at Gen Con this year. So let me let those guys talk about it. Hey, I'm here with my buddy Ross at IDW and designer Richard Launius. We're gonna talk about Planet of the Apes. How you guys doing? It's super good. We're going to be here at Gen Con 2017, uh, Gen Con 50, right? Absolutely. It's good stuff. So we're super excited. Uh, we have the uh, like the, the first copy here for Planet of the Apes. You've seen it at a couple of shows beforehand, and here we go. And we have Richard designer right here. And man. I'm seeing it for the first I time. I know, right? Here. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, so, so what, tell us what you're excited about, man. Oh, look. Now, this is, to me, this is a very exciting game. When, the way I approached it was I really wanted to do homage to the original movie, to be true to the character of Taylor, who goes right. through this discovery for one scene at a time, that gets terrorized by the apes on the process, and, and gets captured, right. and, and possibly tortured, and ultimately might maybe even killed, but you know, continues to move forward to the big reveal at the end. So, so the game moves you through the scenes. You go through major scenes, minor scenes, as you progress along the movie. And there's a, uh, a kind of a track, a race track on each scene okay. where Taylor's trying to get to the end before the apes get to the end. Right. And at the same time, the Statue of Liberty for the entire game is moving along that track. Okay. And if it gets to the end first, then then you, you lose there. So you're always under this challenge of, okay. of beating the apes, beating the statue, moving through the scenes, and the players all working together, which I think is very interesting because they're all Taylor. Right. So there are different aspects of him. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got the clever Taylor who figures out how to pass the note to the apes. You've got the the defiant Taylor who says, "Get your filthy paws off me." You know, you got the commander Taylor. So you've got all you've got these different aspects, and every one of them has different skills. The players are going to have to use together okay. in order to get through these stories as right. they go through. So a lot of card play, a lot of card management, some fun dice rolling that I always like to do because sure. there's no no sure thing until that last die right. roll is made. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So everybody's leaning on the other table and helping you make sure you get that done. At the same time, you're playing cards, key characters from the scene that can help you out by giving you additional dice or additional rolls right. or whatever. So that's how it works. There we go. And we got the classic artwork here. Absolutely. Yeah, the iconic art comes out really well. And what's really fun about the miniatures and all the game pieces, too, is that it really fits that like that nice 80s style, which is kind of what we were going for. There's a lot of cool original art in there as well. And all that art and the pieces of the miniatures all just look super great. So yeah, that's that's the game. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Glad to be on the show. One of the great things about Gen Con is you meet new people every year that you go. And one of the individuals I met for the first time this year was Dan at R and R. Now I met with Dan so that I could get a good look at Dragon Island. This is a game that they just released at Gen Con. Uh, it's got a lot of neat little hexes and dragons and such. Uh, looks like a really cool game. We're going to do an unboxing video uh, on Dragon Island, and this is going to be one that Dad's Game Group is going to play. So one of the other games that Dan was really excited about showing me was Rome. And this is a game that has been out for several years. I think it came out in 2014. 
Uh, but Dan was very passionate about this. In fact, he wanted me to come back by the booth later that day so that he could teach me the game because he really wanted to play the game. I mean, he's a gamer at heart. So uh, I came back, Dan sat down, he taught me and a, a couple other guys, and we sat and played the full game. Now, Dan didn't hold any punches and he pretty much cleaned the clock or cleaned our clocks. Uh, but this is a very fun game. It's gonna be one we're gonna have an unboxing on here very soon. And I'll probably be playing this with my gaming group, so check back with this uh, probably later this year, maybe the first of next year. So uh, Rome, very good game. And then finally, the last game that uh, he showed us was Pyramid Poker. Now, this is kind of like dominoes. You've got little wooden blocks that have the, you know, the uh, standard card symbols on them. Uh, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be playing the game in two phases. You're going to be drawing from kind of a bone pile like you do in dominoes, and you're going to be placing those and building a pyramid as you go. And, and I don't know if you can see this very well, uh, but you're going to have the ones that you place, the faces are going to be facing you, and then your opponent is going to have the same thing. So once all those are placed, then you're going to start taking the blocks off of the pyramid, all the ones that are not covered up, uh, and be able to try to make the best three poker hands that you can. Whoever has the majority is going to win. So uh, mom really likes poker. She likes dominoes. So this is gonna be one that I'm gonna be playing with her in a special mom uh, versus dad edition. So we'll have an unboxing on this one very soon and then look for mom and dad to be playing this on camera. So later on Thursday, I stopped by the Fox Mine booth to meet my buddy JC, and JC's got a couple of new little dice games uh, that Fox Mine is putting out. The first one is Brew Dice. Now this is going to be one where we're going to be trying to roll dice in order to get uh, three symbols on there that, of cards that we're going to have. So we may need to get a coaster, we may need to get a bottle of beer, we may need to get some pretzels. So uh, I got a video on this. So. Uh, show you that here in just a second. The other game uh, that I'm also going to show you a video on is called Sports Dice Baseball. Now, these games were both designed uh, by uh, Andy Germia. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, and he's actually going to show us how to play these games. All right, we're here at the Fox Mind booth, and we're going to take a look at Brew Dice. And we've got the game's designer actually going to show the game off. Right. So Brew Dice, fast, simple game. Uh, everyone gets three dice. You have a beer dice that has a, a bottle, can, or a glass. You have a snack dice, which is a pretzel, popcorn, or peanut, and a coaster dice, round, square, or starred. We got a bunch of beers from around the country, so we're going to flip over a card, and now it's a race to get the bottle, the peanut, and the round. So everyone grab your dice, and whatever you match, you can set aside, and the first person to get all three grabs the card. So it's a speed game. Yeah. Grab the card. Nice. You flip the next one over. First person to get five card wins. And if you're lucky enough to get an exact match on the very first roll, you get to take the card and steal a card from someone. So that does happen occasionally. And I got that one. <laughs> there we go. So first five cards wins. That's that. That's the quick and uh, dirty rule for quick brew and dice. Dirty. Yep, exactly. Fun game to play in a pub. Sports dice baseball. Fast, simple game as well. So it's a, pat, a batter versus pitcher duel. The batter has a dice that has home runs, doubles, singles, and balls. The pitcher has uh, strikes, home runs, double plays, triple plays. So each person is going to roll all their dice and present to their opponent what shows up most. So go ahead and roll all your dice, and whatever you have the most of, you present to your opponent. And that's what's going to happen on the field. So you have uh, two, two, two. So you have uh, an out versus a ball. So three versus two, you win the first pitch, ball one. Roll again. Every roll is a pitch. All right. Now we have four versus four. This is a tie. The batter starts with the power chip. Um, you have the, the decision now to say, you know what, I want to win and take a ball, or I will keep this power and give up a strike right now. So you, uh, you get to decide what you want to do. I'll keep it. All right, so you're going to get a strike. So one and one's the count. Roll again. Good move to keep that a little bit. Let's see what happens. All right, three versus three. Tie again. You're going to take a second strike, or you want to win this one now? I'll win this one. All right, so he gets a chip, he wins the next tie, and now it's uh, ball two. So two and one's the count. We gotta get some hits here, here we go. Oh, three versus three, we got that tri-tie breaker chip is here. Take that out. So that's one out, reset the count. 
and there we go. That's that's uh, sports nice baseball. Every roll is a pitch, and then we uh, move around on the board and see what happens. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. So another game that Fox Mine had that you could check out at their booth was a game called Museum Heist. So check out this video to see what that game's all about. Awesome. So in Museum Heist, there are seven thieves inside of the museum looking to get whatever treasure they can get. Everybody has a set of colored cards that denote all of them, same set. Everybody will pick one of them that they are going to try to navigate towards. So everybody's going to have that secret. And then on your turn, you're going to either move people closer to it, and you can move anybody. You're going to use one of your uh, tokens that lets you swap people. Or you're going to try and guess that somebody has one of their cards. So as you're moving, everyone will start moving them towards, but you don't know which one. Somebody's trying. And eventually, if you can call them out, they may lose. You may win if you're right. Otherwise, somebody's going to end up on it. Everybody will flip over what they had. If there's multiples, then the other person will steal it from you. Otherwise, that person would win. You'll reset, put up another uh, jewelry, and then keep going from there until somebody has three of them. One of the things I always look forward to every year at Gen Con is the Asmodee press party or press event that they have. Uh, it's usually Thursday night, and um, what they do is they have several games that are just coming out that they're kind of giving us a sneak preview for. So one of the games that they had was the Cities of Splendor expansion. Now this has four different modules to expand Splendor. You probably will only play one at a time, but uh, so we got to play a few of these at the party and uh, they're really cool. If you like Splendor, I think you're gonna like what the new expansions add to the game, especially, you know, if you're like us, we've played Splendor a lot. Uh, and you know, if you play a game a lot, it then tends to sit on the shelf and you don't pull it out very often. But uh, the Cities of Splendor expansion, I think is gonna make sure that Splendor gets pulled out and gets played a lot more. So uh, this one we'll be having a special unboxing on and this will be on our channel either later this year or first or next year. So be sure to check back for that. Okay, so now we're up to Friday morning. And as soon as the hall opens, one of the first booths that I went to was Rather Dashing Games. And they've got a new game com coming out called Hafid's Grand Bazaar. So uh, the designer, Mike, who you've seen in some of our other videos, especially from Origins, uh, is going to walk us through that game. So let's check it out. We're at the Rather Dashing booth, and we're going to be looking at Hafid's Grand Bazaar with Mike. Hi, how are you doing today? Okay, so Hafid's Grand Bazaar is uh, our, our take on a Middle Eastern trading game. And we wanted to really capture that very rich and sumptuous feel. So here we have Hafid. He has built this Grand Bazaar, which caravans from all over the ancient world are bringing their wares. You, as a young merchant trying to become as wealthy and as awesome as Hafid, are going to use your, your bidding cubes to kind of uh, influence the market and uh, acquire these caravans. So you'll start with some cards in your hands. And the cards in this game are very unique because these are actually the backs of the cards. So we have five different suits. This one is food. So my opponents know that I have food in my hand. They do not know that that happens to be salt and what the value is. And so this partial knowledge versus uh, perfect knowledge in the game uh, is a, a key in putting together different sets to sell to your customers. So the first thing we would all do with our warehouse in our hand is take turns uh, bidding on these various things. The person who has the Hafid marker always bids first. So we're bidding on the right to claim these caravans. You know, the person that wins the first caravan can claim any one of these six caravans. Second, third, fourth, fifth, and so forth. We are voting on, oh, voting, sorry. We are uh, placing cubes to have these ways to influence the market and hopefully acquire more cards. We're also uh, having the right to trade freely during the negotiation phase, and I'll get to that in a second. And also, there are four ways to sell your cards, which is the way you get gold, which are your victory points. Three of them are here on the board, and there's another one which I'll discuss during the scoring. So, players start, like I said, putting cubes down. You know, you can be outbid, things like that. We've got stuff going on here. So this will fill up, all right, as we go. 
And like I said, these are the caravans. The informant allows you to uh, look at some of what these, get the perfect knowledge of some of these resources and then acquire something from the draw pile or discard pile. This uh, free trader allows you to acquire cards off of another person's caravan from the uh, draw pile. Uh, and then let's say the negotiator allows you to initiate trade freely. So once all the bidding cubes are, are done, we then claim these caravans. When something is claimed, you remove your cubes from the board. After all of the uh, caravans have been claimed, we then enter the negotiation phase, which I talked about right here. Now, only a person who's put a cube down can initiate trades. So if we had a four-player game and only one person puts down a cube, all trading has to go through that one player and essentially be approved. So a lot of ne trade and negotiation games uh, rely on deception. We went the opposite. You have to be honest. You cannot lie, you cannot steal, and you have to honor your deal. Uh, that said, anything goes. You can uh, barter for uh, someone else's cards, some of their gold, some way to influence their market. You can sell their customers. You can buy for that last piece of pizza in the fridge because we've seen it happen. Anything really goes, um, but you know, be safe and don't hurt each other. Uh, as when people are done negotiating, they pull their cubes off. Last cube off ends that trading phase. Right? Then we sell to our customers. Again, you have to place a cube to sell to one of these, have access to one of these customers. First, we have the haggler. The haggler is looking for match sets. So he would want like two, two or more of salt. If I, if I gave him, say, three salt, I would score the gold, which would be nine, and then he would double it for me. So that one's pretty cool. The collector uh, is interested in the backside, the partial knowledge of the cards. If you get one of each of the five suits, you would pay that to them, and he would give you the gold value plus an additional five gold. Uh, the guild master is after one of each in a very specific category, which is the hardest one to get. Uh, but that will garner you 30 gold talents. The fourth way is to apply your wares. If you didn't have access to any of these customers or you just didn't get the sets in your hand to sell to your customers, you can always apply your wares and that's just selling up to 10 cards for their gold value. It is not the best way to make money in the game, but it gets cards out of your hand because at the end of, your, uh, end of the round you can only have 10 cards in your hand. Anything else is discarded for no value. Once that's done, the half-feed marker would pass to the next player. You would repopulate the market. A little bit more would come into your warehouse, and you can start again. Uh, so this gets uh, really loud, really crazy, really fun. Um, and once everyone's had the half-feed marker, whoever has the most gold talents is the best merchant in half-feed's Grand Bazaar. All right. Thanks, Mike. So Play Like a Pirate Day is coming up very soon. It's Saturday, September 16th. And Rather Dashing has a game called X Marks the Spot where you have uh, cards that are kind of like dominoes because they have symbols on each end of the card. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be placing these cards and trying to get uh, or make X's. So uh, Mike's going to show us a little demo of that game. Okay, we're here at Rather Dashing Games, and we're going to be looking at a pirate game called X Marks the Spot with Mike. Hi, okay, so X Marks the Spot is a, it's kind of a hybrid between a domino game and a card game. Obviously these are cards. Uh, your goal is to uh, get your gold doubloons down onto the table. And to do that, you assume the role of one of these four historical pirates, of which their very stylized artwork is actually taken from the flags they flew. All right, so on your turn, you will uh, draw two cards and play two cards. Now, these cards are played domino style, but they can go on top of each other. There's rules for what can go on top. Light can always go on top of like, and uh, goat, there's wilds and, and kraken and all this other crazy stuff. But your goal is to make an X, either orthogonally like this or diagonally like this. Now, this is a ghost ship. This is a wild, so this counts. When you make that X, you would place a gold doubloon down. So once you get three of your, of your specific flag down, you would win. But it's not that simple because this is a pirate game and pirates like to plunder and cheat. So there are these action cards within here that allow you to destroy cards, allow you to uh, steal cards, allow you to essentially cheat, and allow you to negotiate with your other players to trade cards and force their hand to uh, get rid of things. So play goes back and forth. This play surface builds and grows. And uh, no two games really play the same because it is there's a lot of um, on-the-fly tactics. Uh, and just when you think you've got the board and the configuration you want, someone is going to pull one of these out and mess you up. Uh, so again, oh, as soon as someone gets three of their gold doubloons down, that pirate is named uh, the best pirate and that player wins. You may have heard of a little game called Century Spice Road. It seemed to be all the rage at Origins this year. 
So what Plan B Games has done is they have a really, it's kind of a reskin of Century Spice Road. All the mechanics are identical, but all of the artwork has changed and they call it their Gollum edition. So I sat down with Mike and he not only showed me that, but he also showed me um, Dead of Winter Flick 'em Up. So if you also like Flick 'em Up, it's the same game except now you have zombies, but they also have this really cool zombie tower. So uh, check out these two videos. Century Gollum Edition. Right, right so uh, our new release for Gen Con, surprise release was Century Gollum. Um, what this does differently than Spice Road is almost nothing. Mechanically, it's the exact same game. However, fans were clamoring for this artwork ever since it was announced. It's very bright, vibrant, manga, Japanimation style artwork. We just had difficulty selling it to some of our international distributors. Um, so we've caved to our fans, decided to bring it out for Gen Con 50. Uh, one of the two things I, I will point out are subtle differences in Spice Road is that your uh, victory point cards are all unique golem arts. These are these are unique characters designed for each one, so there's no uh, golem in here, no victory point card that has the recycled art that you may see in Spice Road. Also one of the really cool things here that I love about the game is that they have subtle design cues uh, in terms of what your traders are doing and your merchants are doing. So, for example, this gentleman's trading one blue for two green, and they incorporate that into the illustration. This guy's bringing in five yellow for two red. Uh, and so forth. They've discovered three yellow with the acquire action. So little subtle things like that, which I, I think are just really brilliant nods to uh, players. Just just a little, almost like a little neat Easter egg. Um, you'll see that we've replaced the cubes with these really nice acrylic uh, gem pieces, and they're chunky. They're not these little small ones that you find. They're actually pretty big. Uh, They've come incorporated in four different containers that can be combined for easy setup and, and teardown. With the common lid. Uh, the metal coins are subtly different. They're kind of like a copper and a silver, designed to show a little bit of age on the coin. Uh, in this universe, it's not as bright and shiny as it is in the Spice Road Edition. And of course, it couldn't be a century game without some sort of deluxe goodie. Uh, in this case, you can also purchase the player mat for an additional $30 here at the con or on our website. Giant Flick Em Up Dead of Winter Edition, Mike's going to tell us about it. So, what we have here is Giant Flick Em Up Dead of Winter. This is one of our new releases here at Gen Con. Um, what this does is it combines two unique right games, Flick Em Up, just a heads up, made a move our dexterity cowboy-based game, uh, as well as um, so Dead of Winter, which is the, uh, at this point, extremely reputable, deep character-driven games. What we've done here is we've taken the basic mechanisms from Flick Em Up, but we've thrown in the Dead of Winter theme. You're going to see okay. the original Meta Winter here is playable no, here, this. But what no, distinguishes so itself so from the original play is that it's it starts as a, as a fully cooperative game. The first five scenarios in the box introduce a new mechanism. And you're going to have uh, nothing but the gear co op versus the zombies. Over here on the left, you see the giant zombie. This is our programmed AI movement. So after the survivors make noise at the end of each turn, the zombie is going to be alerted to their presence. You're going to stack them on top, drop them through to attack as well as to move. Also, you'll see some interesting features here. The crossroad cards are found over there. Oh, I get. This is and a, one of those cool features from Dead of Winter, there, where and then you get to do uh, one more when certain events happen, yeah. we'll flip over yeah. things. All kinds yeah, of bad stuff happen. You can, you can break an arm, and all of a sudden you got to use your non-dominant <laughs> hand when flipping. Sometimes you'll uh, you'll blow up barrels, or you'll summon more zombies, or there'll be excess noise. Sometimes you actually get something good. Most of the time, not though. Um, Ten scenarios are in the box. Extra stuff that's, that that you may not have seen in the original flick would include the shotgun, the knife, as well as the baseball bat, all for different types of attacks and movement. So one of the hottest games at Gen Con this year was Whistle Stop from Bezier Games. In fact, I think they sold out of it uh, on Thursday. So if you were not able to get your hands on a copy, 
be patient, more are being printed, and they will be available soon. Uh, but this is one I've actually been playing with my game group. We've done an unboxing of, of this already. Uh, we still need to get a couple more plays before uh, we give our review of it, but so far it's looking very good. Uh, everybody's really enjoying it, but I don't want to spoil that review, so I'm going to save that for later. Also, Ted from Bezier Games kind of let us in on a little secret. Uh, it was announced at their Ultimate Werewolf Tournament uh, at Gen Con. Uh, so even though I was able to see it ahead of time, I wasn't able to talk about it. So Ted's actually going to talk to us about it right now. Okay, I'm here with Ted at Bezier Games, and we're going to be kind of whispering because this is super secret stuff. I don't even know what it is. He's not going to tell me. He's going to tell you. <laughs> so what we have here, this is something we're announcing tonight at the One Night World Championship here at Gen Con. Uh, real excited about this. It's a brand new social deduction game. Anyone who likes One Night or Werewords or Resistance, any of those types of games, Coup, that sort of thing, they're going to they're gonna love this. Uh, the, the name of the game is Were Beasts, and the premise behind it is that each player is trying to collect certain types of Were Beasts. Uh, each player is collecting two of them, but the interesting thing about this is they are sharing the collection with one of their neighbors. So for instance, I'm sitting here, these are my two gold cards right here. These are the ones I'm trying to collect, which I would secretly look at and I'd see there's a shark, a were shark, and a were blob. So those are the ones I'm trying to collect. Now my neighbor here, he's trying to collect a were shark and a were zombie. So he knows one of the things I'm collecting, I know one of the things he's collecting, but I don't know what these other cards are out here. The way the game's gonna work is, we're gonna be flip, one person flips over a card, that card gets auctioned off at this point. All the other players then can bid for it, and they can use, of course, Wear Chow. Uh, this edition of Wear Chow, of course, has 90% more villager than the previous one, so Wear Beasts love Wear Chow at this point. Uh, they can, you know, put some tokens in. I'll give you two Wear Chow for that. This one, I'll give you one Wear Chow. This guy is like, you know what? I'll give you my Wear Blob for it. This person says, you know what? I'll even up that. I'm going to give you my Wear Nana, which is ridiculous, and a Wear Chow. So now, at this point, and they can even say, you know what, this isn't worth it, I'm going to take my stuff back, I'm not even going to bid, and he can go, you know what, I'll take two cans of weird child, that's what I'd like, it goes over here to this person. And the next person does, uh, goes ahead and auctions a card, etc. Now, the catch is that any time before you auction a card, you can accuse one other player of collecting a certain type of rare beast. Now, there's a big risk reward for that. If you're right, and they say, yes, I am, like this person says, yes, I am collecting a were zombie, they flip over their card, and I have a chance now to take either all of their weird chow cans or all of their cards. So I'll take all their cards, and now it goes to the next player. If I'm wrong, however, they get to do the same to me. So they may say, you know what, you got a lot of weird chow there, I'm going to go ahead and take that from you. So you're going to have a blind aspect as far as what you take. You may be trying to set somebody up. Yes, yes. And one of these goals could actually be, I have it here, cans of wear chow. So someone actually could be trying to collect wear chow instead of the individual wear beasts. So you're never quite sure what people are doing. They're going to try and uh, you know bid for things that they don't really need, possibly. Although, at the end of the game, you're going to get one point for every wear beast that matches the goals that you have. And uh, the game ends either when we run out of these cards, this is a lot more than the effortless players, but it takes about 10 minutes to play. Uh, or when there's only two favorite players left that haven't been accused or uh, who haven't been wrong about accusing someone. Good. So you're saying this is coming out on Kickstarter? This is going to be on Kickstarter on September 5th. And of course you get all the game here, we're going to have some other special things. But one of the really cool things that we're doing is we are offering some special wear beasts for Kickstarter backers. So one of them that we're going to offer is a wear Thulu. Uh, wear Thulu is of course a combination of person and Cthulhu, which is creepy by itself, but uh, that's one of the things that you'll be getting as a Kickstarter backer is uh, that particular wear beast. And then you can throw that into the mix. And that's wear beast, September 5th. Right. Well, thanks a lot, Dad. Sure thing. So one of my good gaming friends and my dad, Dave, and the Elephant co-star uh, Dave actually was telling me about a game that he had demoed uh, at Gen Con, Gen Con called Okanagan. And it's a little tile laying game. Uh, it's by Surf and Meeple. So I walked over there to check it out. So here's the video on that. All right, we're here with Surf and Meeple and we're going to look at Okanagan. All right, this is Okanagan. It is a game that takes place in Canada. You are cultivating the wilderness. 
So it is a tile placement game and you collect resources to try to score points. We'll go over point collection here in a moment. It is like most tile placement games, one where you have one tile with you and on your turn you place that tile and you will place one of three structures on the tile when you place it. Your silo is placed in the middle of the tile and it gives you one point of influence over all of the areas on that tile. Your warehouse gets placed on the edge between two different terrain types and it gives you two points of influence on the two adjacent tiles. Finally, we have our barn which gets placed in just one of the terrain types and it gives you three points of influence on that terrain type area. Once an area becomes closed, you begin to score that area. So when the final placement is made, you score the area. So you bring out the resources that are produced in that area. The person with the least influence, which in this case would be brown, because brown has one influence, whereas yellow has three, gets to choose one of the actions on the top of the draw pile. And then the person with the most influence begins to draw their resources. So yellow could then choose the three resources for their three influence of their choice. And brown with their one influence gets one of the resources and there's one remaining. So brown will get that resource. Points are scored by collecting resources that meet the objectives. At the beginning of the game, you draw three objectives cards, you draw five objective cards and discard down to three. Objective cards are uh, met by gathering those resources. Resources can be met multiple times, so this card would be met twice with these three resources, and this card would be met once. Resources can also be used for multiple cards. There are two phases to the game. You have a set of your settlements that you use. Once you run out, you draw two more of the objective cards and you again discard down to three. Your final three objective cards are how you score at the end of the game, along with the general objective of getting one set of each of the four colors of resources. After the initial set of buildings is done, you get your second set of buildings. When those buildings have all been placed, the game ends. Each turn, you are required to place your tile and place one building on that tile and then replace it with one of the face-up tiles, which then gets replaced from the draw pile. The other way to gain points is, one of the actions is to draw a gold nugget card. At the end of the game, the person with the most gold nugget cards gets 10 points. The person with the second most gold nugget cards gets five, two, and zero for the rest. And that is Okanagan. It is a fun game of tile placement and resource connect collection that has a lot of dynamics with trying to control different areas. It becomes available after Essen in October. CMON is one of those booths that I seem to gravitate towards multiple times over a convention. Uh, and this year was no different. And probably that is because I have a lot of good friends there and it's always great to see them. Unfortunately, going to a con is the only time that I ever see them during the year. I talk to them, you know, through Facebook or whatever uh, throughout the year, but, you know, being in person and seeing them is, uh, you know, very important to have that, that connection. So uh, every year I go and my buddy Sean always gives me a demo of some of the games that they have coming out. So one of the games is a new deck building game called Gateway Uprising. Now, this is one that I actually have shot an unboxing for. I haven't published it yet. That'll be coming out very soon. And then this is another one that I will most likely be playing with my game group. But he did show me several other games that I do have videos on, including a really cool upcoming game called Richard the Lionheart. Uh, he also has a game called Dream On and has nothing to do with the Aerosmith song. And we even promised that we wouldn't sing about it. So uh, check out us not singing Dream On and checking out Richard Leinhardt. And I promise not to sing the Aerosmith song. Yes. Well, that is that is a promise we, we hope both to keep. Yes, indeed. So this is Dream On, and in this game, it is a cooperative party game where you're going to have a shared dream uh, at the same time. And it's kind of like uh, having like a lucid dream where you're trying to remember all of the details that happened. So 
uh, the first player is going to flip over a dream card, and so the dream might start on uh, a beautiful uh, sunny beach. And as soon as that starts, we start the timer. And then any player with in no player order can add things. I was on a trip uh, on a beautiful vacation, and you know I got sunburnt, and I was so surprised because I had thought I had put on enough sunscreen, and then all of a sudden a dinosaur came out of the water. And your dream will progress in this uh, crazy manner with everybody adding different elements to the story as you go. Uh, and then the game is going, and when the timer runs out, you're going to flip over uh, the cards and you're going to have to try one player at a time to remember the different elements of the dream. So uh, it, on my turn, I may say, okay, I remember that my dream started that I was on a sunny beach and we'd get put the beach card down there. And then maybe you can remember that, well, I don't even remember the next element. So if I could get help from a friend, then I could learn that, uh, oh, I was on vacation. So if you require help from a friend, you get uh, one point for that. If you remember on your own, you're gonna get two points. And if you just can't remember the next thing, maybe I think that the dinosaur came up next. Well, in fact, it was the, it, I got sunburned next. So. The better you're able to remember the elements of your dream, uh, the more points it's going to be worth. So you'll go through uh, player by player, each person trying to remember. If they remember on their own, they get two points. If they need help from a friend, they'll get one point, and if they just get it wrong, they'll lose two points. Now, you may think to yourself, well, why add all these extra cards to the dream that you're having? And the reason for that is that you're gonna get a score based on how well you remember everything, and so uh, the more cards that you put in there, the more potential you have to remember your dream. This is a fun-like game uh, where players can really exercise their storytelling skills because the better you tell a story, the better you're going to remember your dream and uh, the more points you're going to get as a team. So they come into stores uh, in the next month, I believe, and it is uh, 15 to 20 minutes and it plays up to eight players. You know, I like a good uh, Robin Hood story, so my friend Sean's going to tell us all about it. Hey there. So. Richard the Lionheart is a very interesting game. It's sort of a team-based game uh, where you'll be either uh, taking on the forces of uh, Robin Hood and his married men, or you'll be uh, taking on uh, the role of Prince John and the Sheriff of Nottingham and working to usurp uh, King Richard uh, from, the, uh, from his throne. So what's going on is there's a couple of different uh, areas of the board that we have to be concerned with. There is uh, England, uh, where Richard has, has left to go uh, fight the Crusades. So we've got, uh, we've got uh, these different action spots in, uh, around England, and uh, one part of the game is traveling around the board and taking advantage of uh, the action space that you're on on the board. And depending whether you are the Sheriff of Nottingham's forces or uh, loyal to Richard, there are certain spaces on the board that will be beneficial to you uh, when you go there. Uh, each uh, of the different characters has their own uh, character card and has uh, some special ability that sets them apart. And you can even upgrade your characters by uh, getting them a horse token or a ship token, allowing them to move further or uh, in special river areas along the board. You're also going to be contributing uh, to the Crusades where you'll be uh, putting in cards uh, for Richard's army or Saladin's army, or you'll be uh, trying to increase uh, the, uh, like speed up the return of the king or spend the king's treasure. Uh, each of those elements will affect uh, the end of the game. So uh, when you when you uh, contribute cards to the crusade, you will be contributing cards to hopefully help out your forces. However, one team is going to win the game, but only one player from that team is going to win. So there is cooperation to a certain point, but past that, uh, you really want to selfishly, at some point, cut the throat of your teammate and uh, have your own interests in mind. So, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, that sounds like a dad versus daughter show. Right yes, there. I think that that is that that is one that could make some enemies. Because yeah. uh, daughter will slit dad's throat any chance any, she gets. Any chance she gets, yeah. Well, if she's wise, she will in this one. <laughs>
Okay, this is 13, 13 blues, and I beat this is so fun. I like this. I love it. The gray elephant. I beat Dave. And I beat Dave. <laughs> hey, rub, rub, rub. Oh, so he's trying to say that you know, the, the, the age, with age comes wisdom, and so, wisdom comes victory. So when this hits Dad, Dave, and the elephant, yeah, I can, I can, I can gloat my win. Sure. <laughs> Got to have something. No, this is pretty cool. This is kind of like flu on steroids almost, without the annoying roll and move. Yeah. This is phenomenal. This is so fun. I like this a lot. Oh, and it's right. three to how many? Oh, two, two to six. Two to six. Dude, but the oh, six player was insane. I'm not going to lie. Six, the we six player was insane. I played six player. Four player is much better, in my opinion. Well, it's harder with six players to track down. Right. That's it. But I noticed that, like, just now, I, with experience, you start to look for certain things a little bit more clear. Like when he made a guess and he said nurse, I hadn't scratched nurse off yet. And that, so and I that knew was the nurse. only one I had left on top. So I knew. Oh that. my God! So that gave it to yeah, you then. To yeah. Me. So that I was able to scratch nurse off because I knew could, I couldn't be the nurse. So I know. Yeah. When you when you make an accusation, they're not gonna make it. So it's kind of a surprise. One of the other videos that you just saw was for a game called 13 Clues. Now that's coming out, I believe, at Essen. Uh, it was one of those games where I kind of looked at it being demoed and I really wasn't sure how I felt about it. And then uh, Tim Norris and Dave Taylor, my other uh, dad, Dave and the Elephant co-stars, they had just gotten done demoing the game. They're like, Brez, you've got to sit down, you've got to play this game, it's awesome. So I did, I sat down and we had a four player game of it and it was really cool, uh, you know, Basically, as I think I said in the video, this is kind of like Clue on steroids, but a lot more fun. So really looking forward to getting that one, and I think that'll be a hit, not only here in uh, our house with Mom and Megan, but also with my gaming group. So look forward to showing that one off in the future. So now we're up to almost the hall closing on Friday. In fact, it's probably about 10 minutes until the hall closes, and uh, Dave and Tim say, hey, you know, we got to go over and check out this game over at Devious Weasel called Bemused. Now, David told me about the game probably a week before Gen Con. And again, it's one of those games that I went out and I looked it up uh, and I thought, that's what this game is? It, it seemed very unassuming. Uh, it didn't really grab me. And then the uh, game's designer, James, actually gave us a demo and the way he taught us the game, it was hysterical. Now, it could have been that we were a little slap happy from you know the full day on Friday at Gen Con, but uh, he showed us how to play the game, then we played it. We were busting up, uh, we were just very, very silly. So watch our video be very silly because Tim Norris was videotaping it, Dave was taping it, or I shouldn't say videotaping it, we were filming it. Uh, and I, were, I was filming it. So we had three cameras going on all at the same time, and we just got goofy with it. So check this out. Or I'm sorry, playing B Muse. But we're at the Devious Weasel Games, and I am with James Fairley, and of course I'm with David and Tim Preston. How you guys doing? And of course, Kevin, the Manny. We are going to play B Muse, and he's going to take us through and teach us how do we play, my man. Right, I've go. got all these cameras, I don't know where to look. Look, just hey, look. that's the beautiful part. You feel like a news anchor. You get to just look any direction. What do you think about the weather, Phil? <laughs> all right, so, cute camera one. <laughs> Wait, who's one? I'm one. <laughs> I'm the other I one. I thought I was one. I'm number two. <laughs> All right, All right. so in Bemused, it's a four to six player game. It plays in 15 to 30 minutes. Each player takes on the role of a muse inspiring an artist. So everyone's assigned a virtuoso either by choice or at random. Each virtuoso, there are six of them, has a different ability. For example, the painter has the ability to move doubts around the table. The musician has the ability to destroy doubts. The thespian has the ability to turn doubts into dreads. So each virtuoso has their own special ability and they're all unique. As a muse, you want your virtuoso to be the most revered virtuoso in the world. However, all the virtuosos are equally competent in channeling their muse's creative inspiration. So rather than work really hard to build theirs up, they decided it's easier to take a handful of doubt and dread cards and tear the other ones down by placing doubts and dreads upon them. So, I know, it's not a very nice game, but the muses 
you know, you don't fool Mother Nature, right? <laughs> so every time a player takes their turn, they'll draw two cards from the Well of Doubt. They begin play with four random Doubt cards and a Dread card. And they make a play, and then they discard. Draw two, make a play, discard. Four types of plays are, they could play a Dread card. It can go on any Virtuoso, and it counts as negative two, reduces their point score by two. This is all about the points. It's all about that point. About, about that, that point. points. No travel. If you end the game sane, you have a 10 point score, minus one for every doubt on you, minus two for every dread on you. If you end insane, it's the same scoring, but you have a one point penalty. If you are a ghost when you die, you get a point bonus for the number of players in the game, plus one for every ghost, including yourself. So your strategy slightly changes. So I could play a dread card. That's one play. Second play is I could play a doubt card. Doubt cards are keyed to the individual virtuoso. I can only play a musician doubt on the musician from my hand. Uh, for colorblind players, we have big symbols and we have the words also. So I could not play a doubt on the dancer if it was a musician doubt. The other thing I can do is I can take any pair of cards, reveal them, and use them both to make a play, and that allows me to pick a Dread off the Well of Dread and play it anywhere I want. Okay. Now you can't replace cards, so there has to be a slot for it. Now the problem with that is, since I still have to discard, now I'm down to four cards, so I'm taking a card deficit for the rest of the game by playing that extra card. Okay. The last thing I can do is use my own Doubt card, say I'm the, the Thespian, to activate my ability. So I reveal it, play it, and then I use my ability to turn a doubt to a dread, and maybe I do that to a musician, and I turn their doubt to a dread. I'm sorry, to a dread. Okay. Okay? Those are my choices for play. Then I discard, and then the play goes on from there. Okay. Okay? When you get five cards on you, five cards drives you insane. You go sideways, and then when you play, you still make your normal card draw. You get to look at your cards, but you have to shuffle them up. Draw two at random, and choose one to play and one to discard. If you are dead, you lose all of your cards. The way you are dead is you have five cards on you, but there's more dreads than doubts. That will kill you. If you get rid of your hand, you have no hand. When it comes around to your turn, you take a dread card and you do one of two things. Either place it somewhere where it can take it, or transform a doubt into a dread. Okay. Since the points for the ghosts are smaller in general, you want to weaken everybody else to bring their points down so that your points come up. Every player is something called a Gemina. A Gemina is another virtuoso that you've had visions of since you were a child, and you've grown up with these visions in your dreams. So the painter will know what the Gemina is in the secret. The musician will know their Gemini and their secret. So your Gemini, for example, is the musician. And your secret is, you love the musician. So you'll get an extra point if the musician is not dead at the end of the game. Now, whenever the Gemini is face up, you can use their ability as well as your own as long as they're alive. So until the musician dies, you can use green cards to use their ability as well as your own. How does it get flipped up? One of two ways. On, on your turn, you may willfully reveal your Gemini. And then you can use it. It doesn't count as a play. Because that would make that person know that maybe you're not working against them. Right. I'm telling everybody who my Gemini is, so uh -huh. whatever secret I've got, you know it's directed toward them. Yep. Okay? But you don't know whether that's a good or bad secret. Exactly. Now, the other way is every time you go insane in the game, your Gemini flips over. Okay. So if you go insane, your jump, it goes face up, it goes face down, you can't use your ability anymore. Okay. You go sane again, because someone's kind of taking take a card off. You go insane again, it flips again. Okay. Every time that thing flips face up, it fires off a dread card. If you willfully chose to flip it up, you take the dread. If it flipped up because of insanity, that Gemini is the one that takes the dread. Once the game is done, and it ends as soon as there's one or no sane virtuosos remaining, because they could take each other out at the end. So They're all either insane or dead. Right. Okay. Or a combination of those right. two. But it's, if, if there's only one left sane, game automatically ends, or none, game automatically ends, and you count up your points. Okay. Highest point wins. All right. Tiebreakers. Sane virtuosos win all ties. Live virtuosos win ties against the dead. If they're too sane, you can't have too sane tie because 
the game will still be going, you can't have two insane times. In which case, you play campaign style. Let's have another out and add our points together. All right, man. Well, thank you very much, James. We really thank appreciate you so much. The time. It's been a pleasure. Right. Tim, thanks for all the commentary. Well, thanks. Yes, it's thank been you. a pleasure. All Dave, right. thanks for being the other camera. That's it. You too. <laughs> now, one of the games I almost bought, I kind of talked myself out of it, but it's on my list. I'll pick it up uh, at a later time. Is a game called Planetarium from Game Salute. Now this is a really cool game where you are trying to form uh, planets in a solar system. There's four different planets, you have all these rings that show the orbits, and you have all of these materials that help define what the planet is going to be. You know, you take it from maybe a, you know, a gassy planet to one that's habitable by uh, humans. So I was lucky on Saturday, actually it was first thing Saturday, uh, to get a demo of the game from the game's designer, Stefan. So uh, watch our video and uh, you can check out this, this really cool looking game. We're gonna check out Planetarium and this is a special treat. We've got the game's designer, Stefan here. He is going to show us how to play Planetarium. Hi, this is Planetarium. Uh, a, a, a star is born somewhere in the galaxy and your goal is to create a new planetary system. So you have, uh, you have planets, you have two rocky planets and two gaseous planets, and your goal is to make evolution of these planets. But the twist of the game is uh, the, the planet is not controlled by anybody. So you need to make the game to, uh, you, you make evolution on different planets, to be habitable, hostile, or hot, warm, depending on what your uh, final ob ob objective. So some cars, so your objective can be to make an ocean planet, but your opponent wants to be a melted inferno planet. So you need to fight to have to make your uh, final evolution cards and you can pick many other final cards uh, during uh, the game and it's like 40 minutes to one to four players and it's good for uh, it's good for beginner or for expert it's very wide and it's easy to play quick to play and it's very fun so you want to talk about how the planets move and yes, pick yes, up resources sure. yeah sure uh, you can move a mattress or you can move a planet so you have uh, four different kinds of, uh, of manners. You have the rock, the gas, the water, and the metal. So uh, the rock and the gas, you have a lot, it's not a problem. But the water is uncommon and the metal is very rare. So on your turn, you make a move. You can move a planet to crash on the, the, the matters because all the board is uncontrolled by anybody. If you want something, you need to crash the planet and put it on the small boards right here. So if you have the planet A, you put it on planet A, and you will stock your, uh, your matters right there to make, to make cards. So for example, if I want to make a crushing atmosphere, I need to have on planet A, uh, two gas, one rock, and one water. So I need to move, I can move planets, or I can move uh, matters to crush it on the planet and to put stuck right here. So the turn is easy, you make a move, you play a card if you can, and if you have played a card, you can draw a card. You have four different kinds of cards, Low evolution that require one or two matters, high evolution that require three to four matters, but it gives you more points, and you have the final evolution that makes the final stage of the planets. Like uh, this one is a giant, giant planet, it can be a uh, ice giant, a uh, super earth, a warm, war a warm, rocky world, a entrepreneur. It's, it's, it's very uh, depending on what, what, what you want, what you need. And it's, it's a thematic is based on a theory of planetary ship. So uh, that's a game, that's a planetarium. 
Now, how long does a typical game take? Yes, it's, a, it's like 40, 40 minutes. 40 minutes to play one to, uh, to four players. You can play alone. Yeah, you have a, you have a solo mode to play. And uh, it's very uh, entertaining because you have good interaction of players because the, the planet is not controlled by any players. So you will fight during the game to make your final evolution. And the, to learn the game is natural because at the beginning of the game you have many, many matters. But it's easy to pick a matters. But when, to, when you pick a matters, you put it on your small boards and you will spend this matters, you put it on the time track right here, and when the time track is full, the game is finished. But the matters will be removed during the game and it will be more difficult to reach the matters you want. So the tension is become the higher and higher and you can pick more final cards so you can pick up to four final cards during during the game and each player can be they can have up to four final cards but the problem is you have only four map four planets right here so each people will try to make this final evolution depending of a position of the orbits because you have one two three four five six seven the the, the orbits right here so for for example if i want to play like um, a milton inferno it's a warm planet it need to be on orbit one so it's like a requirement of this planet i can make any planet right there but i need to have one planet right there at the end of the game normal evolution to, to, to put it on the car on the planet to make uh, victory points and you can make more points if you be able to make your final evolution card or your, up to four final cards at the end of the game now how did the planets change orbits um yes you need to follow these lines right here so you have the the orbits it's uh, the orbits is the white uh, lines right here and you can change you can follow the line so planet a can crash on this and can crash on another orbit if, if you want so you have one move on on your turn so this planet can move there there or there but you need to move clockwise and the, uh, the 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 matters is the same you can craft there or this one there so you need to manage these uh, your cards to pick the final evolution at the right time uh, it's the, so it depends on your strategy some uh, some final cards right there give you very uh, high points some cards give give you less points it depending of, of what's your strategy what's your final objective uh, require so uh, right. thank you very much thank you again one of the people that i always look forward to whenever i go to a convention is my buddy ryan over at mayday games and they've got a new game coming out called the five seals of magic now this is a dice game it looks really cool uh, sat down with Ryan he gave me a demo of it we will be doing a, a, an unboxing video on this very soon and this is going to be another one that I'm going to get my uh, gaming group to play just kind of wet your whistle and give you something to look forward to but it looks really cool especially if you like dice games Saturday morning I had met up with Dave and Tim in the uh, press lounge and one of the games that Tim was really looking forward to checking out was called Way of the Panda from Simon and um, I had some other commitments that I had to go take care of so uh, Dave and Tim went over there and they were able to demo that I caught up with them right when they were finishing up in fact Tim was in the middle of, middle of his video so I kind of got a little bit of uh, Tim doing that video so uh, check out what I captured
But as you do upgrades, you're going to get a multiplier based upon how well your character has been upgraded. Plus, you're going to be able to move a little bit easier around the board to be able to defeat the ninjas and also to build. You can move around the outside of the board as well. That's about as basic as I can probably explain this one, guys, without getting into too many details and boring the snot out of you. So, we just finished a game. What did you think, David? Okay, well, we played a couple rounds. So, the initial thing is uh, it's, it's pretty thinky. And I think you have to do... It was a little bit slow pacing for me. I kind of took a different strategy. I didn't really move my pandas around too much. I set off in one spot. Yeah, but you I, built up big time. I, spent, I worked on getting some action points, built it up. I have a fully maxed out panda that's going to score me 24 points. I built them up to a three times multiplier times eight points. Also allows me to move my, move my ninja through space, or move my panda through a space that has three. So early game strategy, I was doing something. I didn't score, I didn't really do any building yet, so I don't have any victory points early on. I think that the more rounds I play, I think the game is really going to be um, a lot of managing your managing your little panda workers. Um, I think it's going to be something that's going to have some meat to it, and I look forward to playing it when it comes out. So I like it. What did you think, Tay Man? I thought it was awesome. I kind of went the long game and tried to diversify, which may not been good for a short game, but it, uh, playing around the long game. Awesome. Yeah. First half of next year, check out the way of the panda, guys. This one's going to be an absolute hit. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. So most of Saturday was spent demoing games with uh, Tim from Gray Elephant. Uh, Dave occasionally, but he kind of disappeared and uh, I'm not really sure where he went to. Uh, I think he had his own meetings to take care of. And our buddy Kevin. So uh, one of the first things we had done was go get lunch. So we didn't want to spend a lot of time. Uh, we wanted to hurry up and get back into the gaming hall. Uh, so we went out to where the food trucks were at and there was, uh, of course, long lines for those. And we saw this place, uh, I think it was called Hot Box Pizza. Uh, and if you watch Tim Norris's video, you know what he calls it and it's not really complimentary, but it kind of gives a good description of it. But uh, they were out of regular pizzas. You know, and I'm, when I say regular, I'm talking, you know, like cheese, pepperoni, that sort of thing. Uh, and we saw a bunch of people stepping off to the side waiting for that. When we got up there, there was a sign. And the only pizza that they had was, I don't even remember what they called it. But instead of having pizza sauce on it, it had buffalo sauce. And I'm not really sure what the meat was. And Tim was giving me grief. He's like, hurry up and pay so we can get our food and get out of here. Uh, so I handed the lady my five bucks. I got the pizza uh, and had glitter all over it. And this is, I guess, what makes the pizza special. I don't know. Uh, we took a couple bites of it, threw the pizza away. It was horrible. Uh, I don't know if it was the buffalo sauce. I don't know if it was the meat. I don't know if it was the glitter, uh, a combination. Uh, but it tore me up the next day. Uh, and I know from Tim, uh, from his video, his Gen Con wrap-up video, he mentions it quite a bit. Uh, you definitely want to stay away from it. And coming up, you're going to see a picture of Tim and I standing there with this glitter pizza. So, uh, yeah, from here on out, that pizza is off limits. I will never go there again. Uh, in fact, those of you who know me know that one of the types of foods that I hate the most is uh, Chinese food. Uh, I don't like the smell of it. I don't like the taste of it. Yeah, it's, I always avoid it. It's like the one thing I refuse to eat. I will eat Chinese food before I eat this pizza again. So, uh, enough said, moving on. So after the pizza debacle that was lunch, uh, when we got back in the hall, one of the first games that we demoed was Dragonfire from Catalyst Games. Now this is a cooperative deck builder and on your turn, you each have monsters that you have to fight. And if you don't take care of those monsters, they're gonna come back and they're gonna keep uh, dealing damage to you. So we sat down, we played this, uh, got a couple of pictures of it. I didn't actually do a video. We will be doing an unboxing video on this very soon. And this will be one that we will be featuring a joint review on Dad, Dave, and the Elephant. So you're going to want to come back and check on that. Uh, if you do want to see this game in action, I know Tim Norris did a, a very good video on that. So check it out over at Gray Elephant Games, but uh, check back with us very soon as we will be doing our unboxing. One of the secret games that we heard about at the Asmodee Press event, uh, they said they were going to be bringing it in on Saturday, uh, but they couldn't tell us the title. They really couldn't explain the game to us. Uh, but then we found out what it was, and it's called Majesty for the Realm. 
Now this is a neat little, uh, I don't want to call it worker placement, um, but you are going to be tableau building, I guess is the best way to describe it. You have a series of areas in front of you that go from one to nine, I think. And whenever you play a card into that area, it's gonna activate a special ability or give you money. Uh, it might give money to all the other players who have a condition. So um, got a little bit of video on that. That's gonna be one that I'm hoping that we feature on our channel probably at the end of this year. I think it's an Essen release. So you're gonna to wanna to stay tuned for that. It's called Majesty for the Realm. And that is by uh, Z-Man and Asmodee. 165. Nope, you gave me my point. Did I really? Yeah. What did you have? <laughs> I had, uh, I was one, 163. I was 164. No way! What was your score? <laughs> hey, yeah, no joke. So it was all within one point of each other then, right? All right, so K-Man, what did you think of this? That one? was amazing. It was really nice and fast, uh, simple to play, lot, very very quick. I yeah. loved it. Loved it. What did you so Saturday's winding down. Uh, it's my last day at the con. I'm getting ready to go home. The uh, exhibition hall is going to close in about 45 minutes. So one of the last games that Dave and Kevin and I demoed together was uh, an upcoming game from Bezier Games called The Palaces of Mad King Ludwig. Now, uh, you may be familiar with the castles of Mad King Ludwig, where each player is building out their own really weird and crazy castle. Here, you're all building out the one big palace together. Uh, you're, but you're placing rooms and you are basically controlling those rooms, but other players are going to be playing rooms off of those. They may be placing flood tiles around that and uh, blocking you off from being able to complete it so that you can uh, score points. Uh, looks like a very cool game. The only uh, problem was they were also demoing their WearWords games behind us and that was uh, causing a lot of uh, noise. So. Uh, I was able to kind of uh, look over uh, Ted's shoulder as he explained the game to another group. So uh, again, I'm going to hold off on that video until uh, we feature that on our channel. That should be coming up later this year. So keep an eye out for that. And that is the Palaces of the Mad King Ludwig. So as I walked around the hall, there was one game that I really wanted to check out. And this is a game that Megan is totally going to be interested in. It's called Doctor Who. Time of the Daleks. Now, this, uh, not really sure how to describe this game. It's from Gale Force 9, and I had gone to their booth, uh, I think either Thursday or Friday morning, and I wanted to get a demo of this. Uh, unfortunately, everybody was working their stores since the hall had just opened. There was a mad rush for other things. Uh, this is a game also that's not even coming out until October, so I wasn't able to get a demo at that time. But every time that I tried to go back and get a demo for, the tables were always full. So uh, a lot of people were checking that out. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the great things that I always look forward to going to a convention, either Origins, Gen Con, or whatever, is uh, seeing the people that I only get to see at cons. Uh, you know, like I said, I can talk to them throughout the year through email or Facebook or whatever. Uh, but being able to see them in person um, it's very meaningful and one of the great things about gaming is that it, it's a social thing you know you are sitting around a table and you are interacting you know with your friends with your families with complete strangers um, but here's a little montage of some of my convention family that's what I'm gonna call them uh, that I only get to see at cons um, but I'm glad I did and here's who they are
All right, so that kind of puts a ribbon on the Gen Con coverage. So let's kind of talk about some of the upcoming things that we've got planned for the Dad vs. Daughter channel. Uh, first thing is, if you have not been aware, uh, I have partnered with Dave Taylor from To The Table and Tim Norris from Grey Elephant Gaming, and we have put together a video cast that we do about every two weeks on YouTube. Uh, you can watch it live if you want, or you can watch it later. Uh, it's called Dad, Dave, and the Elephant. And we usually pick a topic we talk a little bit about. We talk about what we've been playing, what games that we're going to be showing off on our channels, and we usually give a joint review of a game. So uh, if you have not checked that out yet, and that sounds like something that interests you, please by all means go out and check us out on YouTube. You can check us out on Facebook. Um, you know, interact with us, tell us what you want to hear us talk about or what you want us to do a joint review on, and we'd be glad to talk to you. So in just a couple of short weeks here, we've got Play Like a Pirate Day. Now, this is something that I launched last year, had a bunch of my friends get together, and we played pirate-themed games all day. Uh, it was a lot of fun, but we also heard from a lot of other people around the world that were doing the same thing. They got together with their friends or complete strangers at their uh, game store and or at their homes, and they were playing pirate games too. So. Uh, be sure to check that out uh, Saturday, September 16th. Get your friends, get your families together, go to your local game store, uh, post your your stories, your pictures on the official International Play Like a Pirate Day Facebook group. Uh, and if you don't know where that's at, just give it a look and uh, you're gonna be seeing stuff on the Dad vs. Daughter page, so I'm sure you'll be able to find it. So check it out, mateys. Arr. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tim the Dad, and we want to tell you about a very special day. It's International Play Like a Pirate Day, and when is it? Saturday, September 16th, so yeah. lots of S's to remember. So, get your friends, get your pirate games together, and get all the booty you can, because yes. we'll be playing pirate games, or at least I will be. I'll be here, riding pirates in the Caribbean. Yeah, so we will catch you guys next time. Bye. So to go along with Play Like a Pirate Day, you're going to be seeing uh, some videos on our channel where we are going to be featuring uh, at least the Pirates of the Caribbean Yahtzee, the, I think it's Battle Yahtzee, and um, Pirates of the Caribbean Battleship. So uh, check those out. Mom and Dad will be playing those. And then Dad and his game group are going to be playing uh, games like Rum and Bones Second Tide. So uh, you've seen unboxings of those if you've been following our channel. So uh, through the month of September, be looking for that. Also, uh, Dad's game group, probably at lunch and uh, during their weekly meetups, will be playing pirate games as well. You also know that October is just around the corner and we always like to play, you know, those spooky themed games. So uh, this year we're gonna be playing uh, some games like Kingsport Festival, and Eldridge Horror. So uh, make sure you check back with us and uh, you can check out our reviews of those games as well. And finally, one of the new segments that uh, I've done in the couple of videos, they haven't actually been published yet, so keep a lookout for that, but it's a new segment I call A Movie and a Game. Now this is where I'm gonna pair a movie with a game that I think matches it perfectly. So. If you want to have a special theme night with your family and friends, you can play the game, you can watch the movie. So uh, those are going to be like one minute segments. They're going to be at the end of the videos. Uh, I might give you a heads up for them, but you know, it also might be an Easter egg to see if, hey, you know, does this game got a, a really good movie that goes along with it? So that's something that you're going to want to keep an eye open for. So that wraps up our third anniversary show and our Gen Con wrap up show. Uh, really looking forward to having Megan back into the channel. Unfortunately, it won't be until uh, January. So, uh, you know, we're just going to kind of continue to do things as we've been doing. You're going to see a lot of games with Dad's Gaming Group, see the reviews and such. So uh, keep an eye out and thanks for watching. We will catch you guys next time.
If you would like to support us, you can visit patreon.com slash dadvdaughter. Like and follow us on Facebook to stay current on our show schedule, sneak peeks at future shows, and to interact with us.